Hey, welcome to Simple Church Online, and thank you for tuning in today. If today's the first time you've tuned in, we certainly hope that it will not be the last. We have an incredible message today. We're calling it Help Me See. But before that, we have some worship that we plan just for you. Possible. 
Yeah. 
canvas Oh, there's nothing better than you There's nothing better than you Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you Why don't you stand up for this part? Sing it with us. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You turn shame into glory You're the only one who cares You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only Sing it. Hey, good morning again, and welcome to Simple Church Online. I want to ask you a question today to kick everything off. Do you think it is fair, or maybe I should say, do you think it's an accurate statement to say, we all tend to resist things we can't control and don't understand? We all tend to resist things we can't control and don't understand. No matter how open-minded you are, or no matter how open-minded you think that you are, this is most likely true for you as well. Because we all just want to make sense of the world, and for the world to make sense to us. See, it's, it's your current worldview that, that allows you to make sense of the world, because that's the framework that you see it through. That's the filter which you filter everything through. So, when our framework is challenged, we all have the same tendency. We have the tendency to, to lock up and to get defensive. It's human nature. It's human nature to resist something new because of something old. 
And this very point explains why those first century religious leaders resisted Jesus so much. It's why at the, at the last minute that Judas betrayed Jesus. It's why so many of Jesus' followers at the last minute ran and they went into hiding. It's why Peter denied even knowing Jesus. Those first century followers had been doing life with Jesus for three years. They got to the point where they thought they knew him and they thought they knew what he was up to. They thought they knew God and what God was about. But it turns out, it turns out they were wrong. It turns out they had some unlearning to do. Luke said that the day before they entered Jerusalem, where Jesus would die for the sins of the world, that Jesus stopped and said to his followers, and remember, this wasn't the first time, but here's what Jesus said when he gathered them. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. Jesus said, all the things that the prophets said, all the things that they wrote, the things that you have heard all your lives, passed down from generations to generations, it's going to happen. It's going to happen right before your very eyes, and you are going to be a part of it. I mean, they had to be just so excited, just so stoked. Then he went on to say this. He, speaking of himself, will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him insult him and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. These men, as we discover later, aren't necessarily brave men, but they decided even after all this to follow Jesus. Now, why did they make that decision? Here's why, look at the next verse. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. The reason they went ahead and followed Jesus into Jerusalem wasn't because they were brave. It's because they had no idea what Jesus was talking about. They didn't understand him. They didn't understand what Jesus was saying. Now listen, did they not understand what Jesus was saying because he wasn't clear? Was it because it was one of those Jesus riddles? Was it because he didn't spell it out? Obviously not. We just read what he told them, and it was crystal clear. He said, this is going to happen, and here's how it's going to happen. But you know what the disciples had? They had what so many of us have. They had their own preconceived ideas. They had things that they were told and things that they were taught. They had a framework that they had developed, that they had put together, and so what Jesus was saying, it wasn't fitting into their framework. They didn't understand it, but they went ahead and followed anyway because they had a preconceived idea. They were raised being told that the Messiah would one day restore the kingdom. They had all of these ideas and these plans of how God should do what he needed to do. They had all of these plans and these preconceived ideas of exactly what it would look like when God would do what they thought he should do. Even though they traveled with Jesus for three years, they still couldn't see what he was up to because it didn't fit into their framework, their theology, their way of thinking. I mean, these guys are still arguing about who's going to be at Jesus's right hand, who's going to be the second in command when he sets up this powerful kingdom. On the way to Jerusalem, they send one of the guys ahead to see if this little Samaritan village would host them for the night, would put them up and, and feed them and give them a place to stay. The leaders in the village said, no, we won't host you. We won't let you stay here because you guys are from Galilee. The disciples came back to Jesus and said, let's call down fire on them. Let's destroy them and their precious little village. This was after traveling with Jesus and hearing Jesus for three years say over and over and over, love people, love people, love people. It wasn't until after the resurrection that the disciples were able to connect the dots, if you will. And then, and then it was another 20 plus years before these guys realized that Jesus came for the entire world, not just for them, not just for their people group 
It took them over 20 years to realize that Jesus came for all humanity, that he loved everyone. 20 plus years before they had the, the aha moment of what Jesus meant when he said, guys, they will know you are my disciples by your love. These were the men and women that followed Jesus, the men and women that did life with Jesus for three years. So if this doesn't make you want to ask yourself, where do I have it wrong? If this doesn't make you want to ask yourself, where do we have it wrong? If this doesn't make you open to something at one point that you weren't open to, I think you may have a pride problem. I mean, who are we? Who are you and I to think that we have God all figured out when the very men and women who knew Jesus, who traveled with Jesus, who were with him for three years, when they couldn't figure him out, who are you and I to think we have everything figured out? Perhaps, perhaps every day we need to wake up and face the reality that we only know what we know. We only know what we see, and maybe, maybe, just maybe, there's more that you and I need to see. If this doesn't make us walk and live humbly, I don't know what else will. Remember something Jesus once said. He said, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. Throughout the New Testament, we find so many people so many guys that have these encounters with Jesus and they just can't see him or accept him for who he really is. R remember the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, Jesus, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus began to talk to him and the rich young ruler said, yes, I've done that. I've done that. I've done that. But, but what else can I do? What is it that I need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus gives him an opportunity of a lifetime. In Luke, the 18th chapter, Jesus looks at this young man and says, go sell everything. And I mean absolutely everything that you have. Give the money to the poor and then come follow me. Now, he wasn't saying to him like he does to us, follow us. Jesus was saying, literally, drop everything and come with me. Be a part of my team. Be a part of my group. Jesus was like, you don't have to wait for heaven to see and experience God. You come with me right now and you'll start experiencing God immediately right here on earth. I mean, what an opportunity. But this young man could not see beyond his wealth. He couldn't see Jesus for who Jesus really was. He just, he just couldn't believe that. It didn't fit in his framework that that's something that he should do. When Jesus was saying these things to him, the young man was going, you know, that's, that's not the way I think. That, that's not the way I believe. That's not the theology of my framework. There, there was Nicodemus who almost missed Jesus because of his theology, and that's still happening today. I mean, it's hard. Let's be honest. It is hard to abandon an idea or an agenda or a political persuasion. When the truth threatens our theology, it's not easy to see, and it's certainly not easy to accept. The Pharisees couldn't see beyond their prejudice toward other people. They, they said, we, we know God. We, we understand God. We've got God all figured out. And if Jesus is really from God who he says, he wouldn't associate with, with those people. Then when Jesus went to Matthew, the tax collector's house, they freaked out. They couldn't accept any of Jesus' claims because in their mind, he would never associate with people like that. That's what they had been told and taught. That's what they grew to believe. Therefore, since they believed it, well, it has to be true, right? Or does it? They were like, if Jesus really is the Messiah, the chosen one, the Son of God, then, well, he would see people how we see people. He would see people how we believe he sees people. He would line up with us. How, how incredibly ignorant does that sound? I mean, it's absurd. Yet, if we're honest, so many of us 
we have this type of attitude more often than not. We are so quick to judge all these ancient, narrow-minded people in Scripture. But maybe, maybe we shouldn't be. Their, their inability, while in the presence of Jesus, their inability to see who he really was and what God was really like and what he expected of them, their inability to see that in his presence blows our mind. You know, maybe rather than just blow our mind, it should cause you and I to have an open mind, to be humble. Maybe it should cause you and I to say, you know what? We may not have God all figured out. I remember after I completed one year of an accredited Bible school and I got hired by a large church in St. Louis. It was then that I began to form and to be blinded by this righteousness approach to faith, if you will. It, it, it said this because of what I was told and taught and, and, and learned to believe. It, my, my approach to faith said this. It said, fidelity, morality, honesty, a rigid generosity. That is my framework. These are the things that are required of me. And, and I, I grew to believe as long as I behave myself, as long as I do these things, I have no obligation to you. You are up to you. There was so much, and I mean so much of the New Testament that was completely invisible to me. It was right in front of me, yet because of the things I was taught, the people I listened to, the books I read, it was invisible to me. I couldn't see it because it didn't fit in my little framework of faith, into my framework of what a Christ follower looked like. My view, my framework, in many instances, it caused me to mistreat people around me, especially people who didn't think like me or look like me or believe like me. And listen, while I know that I will never go back to that, while I know the value now of loving people, while I know what God expects of me when it comes to others, I don't for one second think that I have it all figured out. I don't for a second think, think that I've arrived. I know I have so much more to learn, more areas that I need to change in and grow in, areas that I still need to unlearn in, if you will. And if I stop learning, if I stop growing, if I build a new foundation and a new framework where I'm at right now with half truths, I just start building a new framework that will house more of my new current views. This, this is why I strive to have grown up faith, faith that trusts in God, even when I can't figure everything out. Faith in Jesus, not in outcomes, not in the outcomes of my plans. I've come to realize that my understanding of Jesus, it needs to keep growing that I need to keep an open heart and an open mind. I dare not, I dare not stop asking and seeking and renewing my mind. Because if those first century followers who knew Jesus personally got some things wrong, I know that I can too. I want you to ask yourself the question, am I walking in humility when it comes to my faith? Am I walking in humility when it comes to my faith? Can, can I admit that I don't have everything figured out? I encourage you to go to God with open and humble hearts, with open and humble hands. Because listen, people, people who God loves and created, they are in the balance. I think that there is a story an illustration in scripture that can help you and I get and remain in this mindset of humility and openness when it comes to our faith. So I invite you, I invite you back next week because we're going to take a look at this story. And until then, I encourage you to keep asking, am I walking in humility when it comes to my faith? Let me pray for you. God, Walking in humility 
is such an important part of our relationship with you and our faith. And I pray, God, that we would not be so full of pride that we think we have cornered the market and we think we've figured everything out. God, I pray that we would continue to approach you with open hearts and open minds and open hands. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. This is one of those messages that I just want you to chew on for the next week. And be sure and tune in next week as we look at this illustration that I believe, this story that I believe can help you and I get and maintain this mindset of humility and openness when it comes to our faith. Hey, we want to invite you to join us at one of our live services. We meet live in person every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. We're still practicing social distancing as much as we can. If you've been vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. Our coffee bar has reopened. We don't sell you anything. We give coffee away. We don't have any food yet, but we invite you to come 30 minutes before the service and hang out. You can hang out after the service. It's a great opportunity to meet people. Parents with young children, don't forget, the very last Sunday in July, we are reopening our kids' church. And not only are we reopening kids' church, we are opening for the first time Simple Town, which is a new area dedicated just for kids. And adults, we haven't forgotten about you. Our new sanctuary will open up the very first Sunday in August. I invite you to come be a part of that. If you'd like to give today, simply go online, hit the donate button. It will walk you through the steps. If you want to stay in the loop around Simple Church, the best way to do that is join our weekly email list. Every email, we send out an email just letting you know what's going on in the life of the church. If you want to be on that list, all you need to do is email us at info at simplechurchstl.com and say, put me on the mailing list and we'll do it. Until next week, God bless. Have a great week. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who cares. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies.